Hello, welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast. Great to be back with you as always. And today we're talking ed tech, but most importantly, how these amazing new technologies are helping children, especially in an equitable way, giving opportunities to everybody, no matter where they are in the world. Today, I'm delighted to be chatting to Phil Birchenor, and he's from Discovery Education, and it's a worldwide ed tech leader whose state-of-the-art digital platform supports learning wherever it takes place. Through its award-winning multimedia content, instructional support, and innovative classroom tools, Discovery Education helps educators deliver equitable learning experiences, engaging all students and supporting higher academic achievement on a global scale. Now, Discovery Education serves approximately 4.5 million educators and 45 million students worldwide. That's making a big impact, but I think the story behind what Phil talks about in terms of his personal experience just brings that human element through and really encapsulates what this is all about. Hi, Phil. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Education on Far podcast. I'm all about learning and the ability to learn in a way that suits people, individuals, and also the way that's changing um, as technology becomes more and more prevalent. So thanks so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, looking forward to discovering exactly what Discovery Education has to offer everybody. Oh, hi, Mark. It's really good to be here. And this is something that's really dear to my heart. So very, very happy to talk about this. Amazing. So why don't you take us into into your role in exactly sort of what you're producing within the company? So my role is I'm I'm responsible for the production of immersive content in discovery education. And the, the first thing that normally happens is people say, well, what do you mean by that? Do you make stuff for VR headsets and things like that? And we, we have made some things for VR headset because that's very immersive. And the, the key word is immersion. And anyone that knows me knows exactly what I'm going to say next, which is that immersion is a feeling. It's It's not a technology. It's not even a content. It's just something that makes you feel something quite intense, hopefully, and that then we utilize that feeling as a gateway to learning. So whether it's a, a powerful um, paragraph in a book, a passage in a book, whether it's a piece of music that moves you to tears, something on TV that makes you laugh, cry, that makes you feel that, that you know something, that's immersive content. So w- what we're about is understanding what that is and then creating content that fits around those principles of what immersion is so it's not just headsets but head you know sure for sure vr augmented reality we do a lot of that are highly immersive vehicles for that kind of content so if there's a pupil that's come across something which like you say is really got them excited do they then sort of explore the platform and, and find what their next stage is or is it that once they're sort of within the platform, you can help sort of guide them or, or create whatever it is that they need. Yeah, what, what, what we try to do is create a pretty much an ecosystem around immersion and around this kind of content. So rather than giving you something which is a learning point, you learn it and then you demonstrate your learning, that's great, That's that we want that as well. What we try to do is give them something that's far more open than that. So um, one of our apps is Sandbox AR. Uh, which is a, a, f- a free app out there to, to download for anyone to use and to keep. And that's a maker environment. It's like, you know, think of Minecraft. It's one of those areas where you can make something within it. So our job is to create exemplars of how you can use content like that to create a world that, and because we use life scale augmented reality as well, you can scale it up and you can walk around it and using your device as a magic window. And that's really cool. It makes you feel you're there and you feel you've experienced something. So that's great. So we, we can give you what what's it like to be in ancient Rome, in ancient Egypt. We can take you back in time. We can do all kinds of things with that. But every one of those is going to be useful. But really, what children want to do is create their own world. And what teachers want to do is create something that fits what they're doing in their context. So the more open it is, the better it is for them to use. What's really important, though, is that We can't step back from the standards. We can't step back from the authority we have to give to those teachers to say that this is educationally sound. It's solid. It's robust. And so we give all that scaffolding as well. And, you know, making exemplar content is part and parcel of that. And also using things like narrative. You know, we've got other things that we try to weave into that too. Is like build a strong story, build a a sense that you're going to do something that you've never done before. All of those things keep a, a student really there, really immersed. So it, it's it's a whole bunch of techniques, but underneath it all, going back to what I said before, is that understanding of what is immersion, what happens to the brain when you encounter this kind of content. 
And how long have you been sort of involved in this? Because I'm sort of thinking about the skill set of the teachers now, because mm -hmm. um, I really love that kind of almost like project based, isn't it? You go in, yes. You, you, yes. you like to say, you have the scaffolding and the understanding of what you think the outcomes might be, or, or certainly the yeah. world that you're going to enter or to explore. But then when it's kind of being led by the pupils to some degree, and you're sort of on this learning journey together, that's a very different skill than sort of the traditional model of sort of standing in front of the class. And like I say, just sort of sharing those sorts of bits of information. Oh, very much so. And, we, you know, the, there's so much out there. I mean, if you look at Discovery Education, the number of assets that we've got on that platform are huge. You, you've got hundreds of thousands of, of objects, videos, things you might want to use. How do you access all of that wherever you're getting your, your resources from? And one of the ways you can do that is just by kind of condensing it and creating a journey for the user that actually funnels them in, not, not by directing them towards something, but by giving them an opportunity to make something and to construct something. And giving a student, giving teachers agency over that, I think is a really important step on them allowing themselves to make their own really good uh, th their own good learning content. I'm, I'm a constructivist, you know, that, that that's the background, that's the philosophy of education that I subscribe to. And you just mentioned project-based learning, which I think is an amazing thing. It goes in and out of fashion, but it's always there. And I think it's an, a really important principle. And so in terms of the, the ability to provide this, I mean, you've got the the sense that it's it's global you, you you're in so many countries you've got so many so many students and pupils that are involved in that how do you get to that level where does that sort of investment come in the partners and those sorts of things to be able to obviously set it up but then to continually improve it on a on a regular basis yeah well uh, th yeah we are that there's there's a lot to think about there you know when, when you think globally 45 million students 10 million educators you know using these kind of resources that, that's a lot to go at and also so where does that come from and what direction do you go in there, there's a lot to think about there. there's a lot of agendas that we have to consider but coming back to that last point it's what we want to do is say look here's here's the the pool here's the bucket and this is what you can have, and this is how you get into that. So creating curiosity is something we're all about creating curiosity, because if you spark curiosity, you will find what you need from what's in there. And I think that's really important is, is again, it's coming back to that, weaving that thread of how you get through and where the student comes from, where the teacher lands at and thinks, I think I want to do it in this way. And then when you look, you can find in that bucket, you can find those things because you spark that curiosity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you sort of mentioned the way sort of the technology is used within it. What sort of devices, what sort of access do they, do, does each school need in order to sort of be able to, to make that sort of get the, the yeah, most out of the opportunities? Such an important point and something I think we all struggle with because th there's always going to be a device which feels like you're priced out. For, an iPad is a premium device, but there are premium Chromebooks too. So uh, our augmented reality apps uh, do require an iPad and our TimePod Adventures app does require an iPad or a, um, a handset. Um, so that, that creates a barrier. Um, and what we talk about is a ramp. So we talk about the, the, the technology ramp and how something like a, a virtual reality headset might be over here at the end of the ramp, but you've got a browser down here as well, which, which is something else that most people can access. So if you can access something like uh, one of our TimePod adventures, and I'm thinking of Plesiosaur Encounter, which is completely web-based, and it's proper games-based learning, 3D games-based learning. Um, and if you go in and you involve yourself in that, you're going to really get immersed in that. But then you could also then, if you have access to an iPad, you could create your own TimePod adventure using the app in augmented reality, which you could then scale up to life size and inhabit that thing and record your own video around it and be inside it. And then if you want to go and take it even further, you could download the TimePod Adventures app itself and go on some of the deeper narrative based adventures that that, that leads you through as well. And we're also looking at maybe porting that now to virtual reality as well. So there's this ramp and it takes you up. So hopefully there should be somewhere along the line that you can jump off that ramp or jump on that ramp and take part. And that's important. We're, we're porting Sandbox AR to Chromebook at the moment because it has huge, huge penetration all around the world. 
Um, it's not a powerful augmented reality delivery device, but it's a powerful device nonetheless. So, um, you know, we're compromising on the augmented reality instead of like coming up to life scale, you can shrink yourself down. Honey, I shrunk the kids moment and go inside it and be in your own game. That's really powerful as well to make your own game, be in it, record it and share it. And I think one of the things which over the years of doing the podcast becomes really, really important. And I think it's a real mindset thing for the school as well as the children as well, is the fact that this whole thing is a journey because as brilliant mm. as whatever you're able to produce today is going to look different certainly next year and five years and 10 years. So you're always on a journey, whether it's more technology, different technology, another app and an increase in the software, whatever it happens to be. And I think when a school and an organization understands that this is going to be regularly updated, there's going to be more things happening. It's about deciding you want to step into this world and make the most of it and be able to support in educational terms, your pupils to do it. So it's not about we can't do it because we don't have 30 iPads in the classroom. Like you said, it's where can we use it now? And if we want all of our pupils to have iPads in the future how do we then go about doing that and then I think the idea of the school and the structure of what you're trying to do becomes part and parcel with the sort of learning that you're talking about and I think that becomes very exciting and it also means you can grow as much as you want to stepping into the future. Uh, I, I, I love that I mean that that's it to tell you the truth you've, you've just outlined it and, and I think that's spot on so you know if you look at Espresso in the UK um, they're you know we're, we're really pushing the immersive content now as well because we know it's just another angle that gives a little bit of difference to how a teacher might approach something so you know it, it's kind of like how do you come at all these things you, you, you know what it's like as a teacher it's very cyclical we teach the same things at the same time of year we go through all these different things and you want to do things differently one of the a great quote one of the, my favorite things that a teacher ever said to me was that this makes me want to teach and that was music to my ears I thought yeah exactly I remember that because going back to before we had iPads and I'm showing my age now but before they came in and everything I remember going into a classroom and one of the a moment for me that really taught me something was a teacher that was teaching World War II and she'd closed all the curtains in the classroom and she'd got the children under the tables and she played a, an air raid um, siren going off and and she just gave them an idea of what it felt like to be in that and that was immersion you know there was no technology involved other than uh, playing a sound on a tape it was on a tape recorder and I thought yeah that's it and that that really taught me something so you don't need 30 iPads you actually just need to understand what it is to create a bit of drama a bit of attention uh, that word engagement which we hear an awful lot of um, and I'm a bit like this about engagement, it's important, but it's it's just the beginning. It's not the end of the journey. People often say, right, we've engaged them. Oh, it's easy to engage children. I could take a PS5 in and engage them all day long if I wanted to. But I've got to make the needle change. I've got to move the needle at the end of the day. So what have I done? What do they know that they didn't know when they came in? So that's that's our mission. That that's That's what it's about. And I think we've all experienced the wow days, like you say, that engagement yes. kind of, yes, I want to know all of these things, <laughs> but where do we go from there? And, I, and I've, I've just experienced this myself, you know, it's a new term, I'm a musician, you know, it's what is performing, I'm teaching in um, drums. And that first lesson, you can just see the kids yeah. going out of the class as if yeah. like, you know, they're about to play at Wembley next week or something like that. Um, and and I know that, you know, there's work and there's a whole structure of things that we're going to be doing from that. And so, yes, you've caught their attention in that first time they've gone into a drum room and there's a kit and they're making the noise and all of yes. that. <laughs> But allowing them to kind of find their way and explore it in a way that's going to be supportive to them to want to put the work in because it doesn't obviously just happen. But like you say, understanding that journey and, and being able to sort of follow that in a way that not only is my structure or the way that I teach, but yeah. actually is related to each pupil then I think that's where the technology starts to come in because you can sort of have this sort of personalized learning in a way which was much harder, I think, in, in sort of days gone by. Yeah, and, and you know, you know, when, when you look around the room and you're teaching and you need the drums and, and they have that first encounter, you know exactly what's going to happen with some of them. All of them are going to talk about it. But you know, for some of them, you might change their life. You might set them on a journey 
And you, who knows, you know, but it's going to be something that's a friend to them through their whole life, something that gives them an enormous illumination and satisfaction through life. But it's memorable. And I always remember my first, the first time I showed, uh, it was a long time ago now, um, it was very early days for augmented reality, and I unveiled it uh, to a group of schools and a group of teachers. And there was a teacher with an iPad, and she had it in front of her face like this. And, and we were doing a World War I project, and the cenotaph appeared on the floor, in front of her through the iPad, and she looked absolutely shocked. Um, and and she looked around the room to check that no one was looking, but I was looking, and she looked underneath the iPad to check that the cenotaph hadn't actually materialised in physical form on the ground. And you know, she that she was one of the she was in that group that said this makes me want to teach. It's like it stuck with her, and she did. She used it for like a decade afterwards. She was still using those materials because it made such a, an impression on her. It's the what next, isn't it? The yeah. wow moment we can we can generate, but the what next takes a bit of doing, and it takes the educational rigor and all that authority you have to give to it and say, no, I understand how this happens. I understand what you as a teacher need to do. I understand how you as a pupil learn. Now, here's some things that will help you to do that. You can express your learning, experience it in a way that's meaningful to you. And how did that sort of passion come to you? Because it's obviously you've got the education passion and the wanting to learn and the, you know, the technology side and the, and the computing side and, and the understanding of those things. What was it that kind of sparked your interest and in how have you sort of obviously managed to keep your foot in both camps in order to create such a great resource? I, I was very lucky in that my, my first school, um, uh, I joined as part of a project called Raising uh, Standards in Inner City Schools in 1991 um, in Inner City Manchester. And through that, I was given space and time to do things differently. I was so, so lucky. It was the early days of, uh, you know, the BBC Micro was in schools, where Acorn computers were coming in. Um, and it was a technology project, but technology then meant, um, uh, all the teachers will remember this, bow play, which was like a huge German version of Meccano that was like life-size. And it was Meccano, it was Lego, it was doing things like that. Lego Technic had just come out. That was the technology we're referring to. By the end of the project, six years later, it was computers. Um, but I was given the chance to experiment, quite frankly, and to to see what worked. And, you know, some of I knew storytelling was really important. And for some of those children in an infant school in Mossside, they responded incredibly well to something that was driven by a strong narrative that made them want to stay the course, to hear what happened next. And through that, I was able to start thinking about how you might develop education materials, content that would really make a difference. And this is really why I love doing the podcast, because it's that sense of we want it to look a certain way. We want it to develop in a certain way and also making the most of your opportunities. I mean, I, I'm, I was, as you were saying that, I was just thinking back to my experience. And this is when I was actually at school. I had no intention of being a musician or learning an instrument in any particular way other than the fact that I was told by um, the school that I was going to in the secondary school that the first year we were going to be there you had to learn an instrument um, and they came around to the primary schools and you sort of blew into a mouthpiece and played a rhythm and whatever and they kind of put you in a certain area um, and I thought drums seemed like the best of a bad bunch you know here we are sort of 30 odd years later having made a career out of it um, amazing <laughs> but, but it, it, it's just that sort of you see these opportunities, they come out of your left field in some way or another, but it's then, like yeah. you say, when you kind of, you get that, there's something here that I can't tell you exactly what it is or how it is, but it affects me in a way that I've never experienced before, or I want to explore more, then you have to jump with that. And I kind of, I can tell exactly that's the same thing that we're talking about here. And also being able to share it here is the fact that if it's something that people haven't come across to be able to then just go away and one, have a look for themselves, but to be able to then take that conversation to their senior leadership or to sort of bring it into their classroom in some way, which makes a difference almost immediately. It, it is such a great gift. And I love the way technology has enabled us to do that. But like you say, but the, the sort of core essence of, of what it is to learn and what we want to be as human beings just comes to the Absolutely. fore. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I'm always reminded as well as um, a, a colleague of mine, um, uh, Andrew Hammond, he's a head teacher in Wimbledon. And uh, he always tells the story of uh, the 
the blue car and i tell the story a lot as well because it, it just resonates so much of of like in the nursing i i was um not long since being a soldier when i found myself in a school in moss side and uh and i was put in the nursery and so i'm used to the, this scenario meant a lot to me it's like you'd see children pushing a car around a toy car around the floor a blue car maybe and the the instinct for the teacher is to say um how many wheels has the car got how many what what color is the car And that was all very interesting and they'd give you an answer and that was great and you felt that they'd responded well to a, a learning opportunity. But as Andrew always said, he said, the, the, the question to ask is, where are you going? Because the child isn't pushing the car, the child is in the car and they're on a journey somewhere. And the, the response you get from asking a child that question is completely different and far more interesting and will lead to far more Uh, opportunities to to learn than just how many worlds does the car have and what color is the car and that that always stuck with me as well and i think i think we all have these little things with we're lucky enough to remember these moments along the way and you know me sticking a um a cover to a roma if you remember romas the robots in <laughs> classrooms and they had these little domed covers and i i covered one in tin foil one day because i thought i was going to um make a story with with the children and i stuck it on top of an acorn computer and i programmed a timer to set off an alarm after about an hour and a half so in the middle of the lesson the timer went off and it delivered a message from santa claus who had his you know he'd had a terrible accident and his reindeer and everything he his sleighed crashed in moss side and uh he needed the children to help make a torch out of these materials that we'd put that he'd put together this list and the children um, year ones just flew into this task like nothing uh, i had to tone it down the next day uh, parents came in and said could you just tone it down a little bit didn't sleep a wink last night she was crying all night because santa's not coming uh, so you know and i thought well two things there this is working and secondly wow how powerful is this yeah. and i think those those things that particular moment that was the starting point for me that santa claus story that thing in 1993 was where I started to think about how we could make more and more of this. Amazing. And and how do you kind of get this essence across to the rest of your team, the people that are working on it in various different departments? Because um, obviously your enthusiasm, enthusiasm comes over so, so, so powerfully, <laughs> but I'm assuming it probably filters through everybody because it's that kind of enthusiasm across an organisation which actually enables these things to thrive. Yeah, there's there's uh, there's a starting point, which is when you announce what it is you're going to do. Um, and certainly as I came into Discovery Education five years ago, it, this was a new venture to bring immersive content into it. So you've got a lot of people that have done things the way they've always done things, and that's good. And it's been very successful. Um, Games-based learning, gamification, immersive content sounds a bit like you're just having fun sometimes. Um, is that OK? Can you do that? So again, that's why I always talk about rigor, you know, and understanding the process and understanding the context of underneath everything else. I know that something else somebody told me a long time ago through National Grid for Learning, content, yes, content rules, but context is king. So understanding that really makes it work. Secondly, you've then got to make something that delivers on the promise, that makes people react in the way that I want them and my team, our team, uh, wants them to react. So we make something that brings joy that brings learning, that brings engagement, that turns that engagement into an investment by the individual in their own learning, and hopefully uh, something that leads to affinity, which is, I want to learn, I want to know more about this. I, I really love that. And I think it's something which is so important, no matter whether you're building something, whether you're a teacher, whether you're leading people, understanding all of those things in the round means that you can make a difference together and everyone's on the same page whatever little sort of path of that or whichever bit of building that you're doing within that is is such a really powerful such a really powerful thing now interestingly when people talk about these things there's there's usually a teacher or a learning experience which you can kind of think ah, oh, that that struck me when i was younger as well or certainly something which maybe it with like say when there's a new venture coming out you kind of think oh yeah it reminds me of something that's happened back there is there anything of that you'd like to share I, I think it, for me, it always goes back to that, that school in Moss Side, Claremont Infant School, 1991. Um, I'd not long since been out of the army. Um, you couldn't imagine a more different environment for me. And there I was um, uh, placed in a nursery as part of this project. And, uh, and the head teacher there, uh, Patricia Lee, 
uh, was just this amazing person who just gave me space and time and believed in me and and let me and listened to what I wanted to do. But she had the most incredible array of skills, um, ability to understand people, to see what was needed. Um, she had the, the the most incredible education foundation under things. You know, she really was that person. She was the real deal. And she just gave me the space and time and encouraged me to, to do that. And I'm forever grateful to her. You know, I, I used to call her to her face. She was my second mother. You know, she 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 really, really took me under her wing and enabled me to to move from that, from being a soldier to moving, going into, becoming into a teaching environment, into the classroom, and then and then just spreading my wings and then doing something completely different. And just her thirst for things to be different and to be new as well was just a, a marriage made in heaven, I felt. I think for me as well, you, you sort of mentioned two or three times that idea of the rigor and, and, and the content mm. and the context yeah. and all of that. And I think to be able to really understand both sides of those coin in order to create a greater whole is something which is a, a real gift. And especially when you've got someone like you've just described who knowing all of that gives you the freedom and mm -hmm. the, the space to be able to explore it and learn it and develop it in your way because as as we can see you can then take ownership of it and then that ripple takes you into your further career and the people that you're teaching and all of that and it's uh like I say it's a really hard thing to do but I love hearing that so often because I think it really means that people feel rather than constrained as I must do it like this or like that actually that freedom has a much more far-reaching result yeah and and then there's there's a little bit of luck for me as well in in that there are a lot of people who want to give that now but who feel perhaps restrained that they can't do that so uh, if you think back to 91 you're you're far too young but 91 92 when when I was there um this was just as the national curriculum was about to become a thing and we were talking about baker days kenneth baker uh, ofsted was uh, just about to start there was a we we were allowed to do things like that then we had the space to do it and and head teachers and schools were looking for those things to be different and then you've got to look at where i was uh, an incredibly diverse rich vibrant community where education was unbelievably valued and children used to bounce into school and so did the parents and it, it was i felt i was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time with the right people and I know you sort of mentioned the the journey, the the story of the car and everything. But is there is there a piece of other piece of advice that you've been given, or even a piece of advice you'd give your your younger self now, sort of looking back? Is a is a slightly more mature feel, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm terrified of giving advice. This kind of sage advice from the precipice of a 62 year old, which I know is not that old, but it feels it sometimes. Uh, and you're looking down and you're thinking, what advice would I give? And I'm very reticent to do that. However, the one thing I would do is just to say, it sounds like I, I went out there and I did what I wanted to do, but I would have done more. And I think, you know, that there's a time in your life when the consequences aren't so great of taking a risk. And, and I think, take those risks. Um, don't be frightened of making mistakes. I spent a long time studying with the Open University um, complexity analysis and the failure paradigm and what failure teaches us. And uh, I understood it really well, but I wished I'd lived it. <laughs> and can you take us into that a little bit more just in terms of the fact that I think it's such an important thing from an educational standpoint because I know certainly from my experience of as I say teaching music in schools but certainly for my kids going through the education sort of system there was so much of a sense of I'm supposed to know the answers I'm supposed to get it right I'm supposed to get your A and your A star and that yeah. sense of taking a chance failing learning from those mistakes is something which seems a little bit harder to do these days so I'm, I'm curious as to your experience but also like I say from what you've actually sort of studied as well with it yeah it's, I, I think it's, it's it's such a big deal this this fear of failure which we've got you know I'm sure all of us have listened to Ken Robinson um, talking about failure and what what it means to fail and and he, he was absolutely right and you know the metacognition that that we as teachers sometimes we can fall into a trap of of believing something or or dropping in an idea you know like, like you're not very good at maths um oh you do this because you're better at doing that which then re tells that child that you can't do this and and being very very careful with our language as teachers so that we don't introduce the fear of failure so much 
um, because that's partly our responsibility as well. That that whether they fail or not is is often down to us too. You know, we have agency in that as lo as well as they have agency. So as a teacher, you can't control all the variables. They can't control all the variables. They've got their lives. They might have terrible things that they're trying to combat and encounter encounter in their lives as well. So all of these things is just it's. It's been super, super careful, I learned very early on, as to what you say and how you say it to a child. It makes a massive difference. The, just the casual stuff. It's like pay more attention to the casual stuff in the classroom um, and what you say to them. And most teachers do, I think, now. I think that most pe teachers are super aware of that. Yeah, I, I really love that. And I also love the fact that it, it can be such a positive as well in terms of it's those small conversations and things that you actually become aware of that you find out about a child and what the, you can learn about them, which then yeah. creates a relationship which is far beyond what yes. you're just teaching in that classroom on that particular day. Oh, and yes. and yeah. that just sort of opens up a whole world, doesn't it, of trust in everything that we've been talking about, I think. Yes, yeah, but, but very, very much so. I mean, I, you know, I, I remember... Um, children from that time uh, that I encountered that were undergoing the most awful stresses and everything and you want to envelop them and you want to take care of everything and you can't what you can do is do what you do really really well with thought and with sensitivity yeah really really important um, now is there a resource you'd like to share and this can any, be anything from a video a song a film book something which has had an impact professional or, or personal but something which you think would be would be worthwhile yeah, yeah. The, and and forgive me if this is a bit left field, but I was terrible at school. I was really, really bad at school. I was completely disconnected, disengaged. I was expelled a few times. Um, I really wasn't a poster boy for a, a good journey through education and on to doing other things. But there was something, when I was 10 years old, um, I was given a Look and Learn comic and I was uh, a subscription to Look and Learn magazine. You probably won't know it, uh, but it, if you go to lookandlearn.com, you'll see its history. And it, it spoke to me in the ways that I like to speak to learners now. It, 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 had, it was colourful. It had really interesting stories about things that had happened. So it taught me history through the stories. Amazing illustrations. It was like full of facts, you know, things that made you stick in there as well and want to know more. It appealed to all of that. And I, and I think, you know, look, look and Learn magazine, it might sound a bit trite, but it was a huge, huge deal for me when I was uh, a child. So I was 10 years old when I got my Look and Learn subscription, uh, a summer holiday. And uh, I just ate it. I just absorbed every single thing in it. And I was devastated when I when it finished in uh, about 30 years ago but yeah it was a big deal yeah i love that because i think in essence it's exactly the same thing that you were talking about at the very start of the conversation in terms of what you're able to produce now based on what you're creating and the technology and all of that but i think it just re-emphasizes again the sense of that excitement and that understanding what you're trying to do what you're trying to explore what you're trying to step into is, is something that you're learning about and so i love the fact like say whether it's sort of a generation different or a different medium or whatever yes. it happens to be the essence of who we are and what we're doing is going to be the same it's just the way that we where we find that and how we come about it so yeah i sort of love that sort yeah. of full circle yeah moment. i mean I'm, I'm an absolute learning junkie which my early teachers would have been like they would have laughed if uh, they, they'd heard me say that but i am and i was then as well it's just i wasn't learning in the ways that that had meaning to me and that's not their fault you know it was just a product of circumstances yeah and i'm sure there's lots of people listening you can identify with that and uh, yeah it's a it's a continuing cycle of, of those things. yes yeah <laughs> Um, now, the acronym FIRE is obviously important to us here at Education on Fire, and by that we mean feedback, inspiration, resilience and empowerment. What is it that strikes you when you when you hear that, whether it's one word or, or the entire phrase? Yeah, I mean, gosh, the feedback is really, really important to me. And, uh, you know, that there are people that um, have given me some pretty brutal feedback in the past. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> particularly there was a... Uh, going back to the 90s in Manchester, in the early noughties in Manchester, there was a, a fearsome um, school inspector, really, really fearsome. He was everything you, you thought they were at, the, at that time. But my goodness, he knew his stuff and everything. And he put me in my place a few times because I was this ardent, on fire, kind of I knew the answer person that was stridently heading out there and everything going to change the world and everything. And that's all great. But he, he actually gave me the 
he, he sat me down a few times and, and told me a few things. And uh, I'm over, always been grateful to him for giving me, you know, we, we, we talk about feedbacks. Feedback's a big deal in the classroom. And we all talk about a certain type of sandwich that you get, which has got all the nasty stuff in the middle um, when you've been observed. And he gave me all the nasty stuff, but he didn't try and sugarcoat it. He just told me and he gave, but he gave me direction as well, um, which was to be, was to listen more and to be more open and to consider things from a different point of view. Sounds dead simple and dead cliched, but honestly, it made a big, big impact on me. And I've never, ever forgotten that. I've always been grateful to him for giving me the ability to, to be that person that, that can see everything from a different point of view. And, you know, w working through those that that time as well, the inspiration that, that set me on the way, you know, people like Patricia Lee, the people I worked with, the parents that I met inside uh, Claremont Infant School and other schools. And when I went on, I, I then went on to teach up to um, Key Stage 4 as well. So, it, you know, meeting parents and meeting people on journeys that valued education that weren't listened to and that were perhaps a bit disempowered themselves and disenfranchised themselves, that was always inspiring to me as to what they would do to make things right for a generation that was the next one for them that they couldn't change for themselves but they would for the next generation i always found that deeply inspiring as well yes. and, and i think resilience comes in around that too yeah that's so incredibly important and and the feedback thing i always find incredibly interesting because as soon as you take the emotion out of it it becomes very straightforward and it might say so it might yeah. be hard hitting and it might be very yes. kind of yeah. oh really um but if you don't take it personally and you just see it as a way of gathering information and moving forward it's fine but it's very hard well certainly for me but i know for many people for it not to be a personal thing and just a professional oh, yeah. thing or just a factual thing it's an incredibly difficult thing isn't it to 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 navigate and i, I don't think it will ever be easy for anyone i don't think but i don't think that's that's what it should be either. You know, the idea, we, we talk about these ideological states where it's all just about personal development and everything. It's not. It can hurt. It can really, really hurt. You've got to pick out what's good. And I also, I also admire people who can give feedback like that. I'm terrible at giving feedback, you know, really honest feedback, because I don't want to hurt somebody. And I think we can all learn from the people that are good at giving feedback that actually you can do it and it can make a difference. Yeah, and I, and I guess the final piece of that puzzle is the fact if you're if you've created a a sort of a three sixty environment of that, it only becomes one part of the whole. So if you feel supported within your school, for example, if you know mm -hmm. you're doing great work and you're seeing great results, and you feel that you've got your colleagues have got your back in that kind of thing. So like I say, even if it's hard hitting, even if it's something which takes you back a little bit, it's one part of that entire picture that I think. Even if it, like, say, it hurts a little bit, you kind of feel like it's not sort of all or an, all or nothing, and and I, I guess maybe that's something completely. that we can all think about. Yeah, yeah, c completely. And I, I know in in our team we we we're very honest with each other. You know, the team that makes um, uh, the immersive content team, we're very very honest with each other. But we also respect each other hugely because we we are that they are amazing at what they do, incredible at what they do, and they will listen because it's such a trusting environment. You can make, you know, going back to making mistakes, you can make mistakes in full view, and it's okay because we know why you're doing something. It's a big deal. Phil, thank you so much for chatting. It's it's been amazing. I've loved I've loved the story. I've loved the idea of how it's all come together. I love your enthusiasm about the whole <laughs> thing. Um, tell people where they can find out more and going sort of... Uh, Get, get a go for themselves and, and yeah and yeah it. Th well th thank you for that mark it's, it's been brilliant to talk to you and and yeah i, I can tell we're, we're birds of a feather when it comes to how we approach these things so it's always lovely to speak to someone so like-minded um discovery education go to discoveryeducation.co.uk or discoveryeducation.com if you're across the atlantic or somewhere else and you will get access and you'll get guidance there as to where you can pick up things uh, the sandbox ar app is free on ios to download to keep forever um so look look that up sandbox ar on uh, the app store and also time pod adventures uh, as well and we have lots of other different free resources out there and if you want to hear more about immersive just on its own go to uh, immersive.discoveryeducation.com and you can hear all our thinking about it, what we do, and, and get access to free resources and maybe get some ideas about how to enact it in your classroom as well.
Fantastic. And we'll have links to all these things on the show notes as well. So if you didn't manage to grab it straight oh, away, you'll, you'll be able to you'll be able to click um, click straight through. And and just finally, this is why I love these conversations so much is because I've been to the website. It looks amazing and you really do get a sense of what it's like. But it's not quite the same as sort of hearing your personality come through and, and your passion for what you do. And then you can start to see how all those dots join up. So, Phil, thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a delight. Thank you. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.